when you had the, the script, what sort of reaction did you get when you first well, went around? F first of all, I, I, I contacted an old friend of mine, Sidney Rose, who was a, a, a producer. Um, and he had done, he'd worked on Superman 1. I mean, he took me down when I was a young lad. He, he optioned a script of mine and he took me down to Pinewood Studios because he was working on Superman 1. And I met the great Christopher Reeve there um, and he introduced me to people. And that was like a fun day. I was in my early 20s. So I contacted him again. I said, you know, are you still active? And he, he'd done the Kids Are All Right, Quadrophenia. He'd done a lot of other, other stuff. And he said, yeah, so send me the script. And he said, wow, Robin, this is, this is really good. He says, this is something that hasn't been done. Unfortunately, Sydney died um, I know, three years ago now um, of cancer. Um, and I mean, he was very enthusiastic project. So that sort of slowed us down a bit. We had to re regroup and we brought Ted Kotcheff on. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Chris Carson in, in the States as a, as a co-producer. He's an Academy Award winner. He's in LA. So we, we built a group of people together. Um, and that's, that, that's basically what we got. now. What then happened is I put it up on IMDb as in development, and then I got a flood of, I mean, I got thousands of emails from people, mm. a, a predominantly crew behind the scenes people. And, um, and for example, um, Ian Wingrove, who's a special effects advisor on the movie, I mean, he did Troy, Henry V, um, Black Hawk Down. Now these are major movies and he's a major industry player in special effects and he came to me and said Robin you know you've got to make this movie I'm going, okay well great can I be involved in it I said I you know we're in development we have no funds at the moment it doesn't matter how can I help you Rocky Taylor stunt supervisor on 17 Bond movies did stuff on the Da Vinci Code came to me said the same thing Anthony DeLongis who just did Indiana Jones as a fight director said the same thing. He was in LA, so I went to, to his ranch when I was in LA and, and met with him. But then you, you decided to go independent? Well, we decided to, because I, you know, I have a lot of experience of dealing with, with guys in Hollywood. I'm always in Asia, I was doing line production for a lot of Hollywood entities. And when we started to do this in the UK, the first thing I said to my partner Lance is, we're going to go down the normal film route, and I can tell you now they're all going to turn it down. And there's going to be reasons why they won't do it. And it's the same reason why it's so hard for a good British movie to be made in this country. It's the same old attitudes by the same old farts who have been there for, for, for decades who can't do anything anymore. And the real hard workers are the independent producers, the mm. independent directors. The actors who take a risk on a project and all those crews because they've seen it too many times, they've seen the same old stuff going on. But we went, we, we applied to all the usual suspects, and I, I said, I can tell you now, this is what they're going to say. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and lo and behold, they all came back. So we decided, okay, we're going to set up a PLC, which is a public limited company, which affords us the opportunity to one, go down a studio financing path should it become available to us. Two, go down to in, in institutional investors should that become available to us. And three, more important, is to get the public involved. In other words, we could sell shares direct to the public. That's what a PRC can do. A private company can't do that. So we went down that path. And the most important thing is, can we get the funding for this movie and do it the way we want to do it? and not get funding from a major Hollywood studio which will say, well, you've got to get this producer, you've got to have this actor, you've got to have this, blah, 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 because they think they know what they're doing. And more often than not, Hollywood now can't produce, and this is a low-budget movie, it's a £50 million budget, and that's low, that's low budget. Mm. Now, people may not think that is, but Robin Hood with uh, Russell Crowe cost $200 million to make, excluding prints and advertising which could range anything in the states from 25 up to 50 million and it's not going to get its money back theatrically for sure it's going to have to go to DVD and television so and I don't know where they spent the 200 million on that and a lot of it's on CGI and stuff like that so you know uh, and I don't know how much Russell Crowe got paid for it maybe 30 million I don't know so you're gonna keep the control of 
of licensing and, and merchandise? We will control everything. That's the whole, the beauty about setting up a PLC is the investors get a share of the action of everything. Often what happens is that an investor will come and invest in a movie and then the merchandise and marketing is done through a separate company. Now just to give you an idea of what value merchandising has, Lord of the Rings, I think worldwide did 900 or a billion per episode theatrically, great, a hell of a lot of money on DVDs, but merchandising it did over a billion dollars worldwide. Now, if you think, depending on how you control it, we're looking at probably something of 35% of that billion dollars comes back to the PLC. And that is split amongst the shareholders. There's a transparency there. There's an opportunity for an investor, even a small investor, to put some money in. It's a gamble. It's a risk. All movies are gambles and, and a risk. But here you are getting a chance to get a piece of all the revenue streams, not just one revenue stream and all the other revenue streams are hived off through other companies. If this model works, it's a model that can be used again and again. It's a model that maybe the British government should look at giving tax credits to, to people or tra tax relief in a certain year. I mean, there's, there's other ideas I'm working on at the moment that I'm going to try and, and present to the government. There's ways of getting money investment into British movies if it's set up a certain way that people don't take advantage of, because there's been a lot of in the press about um, certain big funds getting tax relief and then all these big stars are now going to have to pay the tax money back because it wasn't handled properly. And I think there is a possibility of putting a certain type of company together that is orientated just for film that can then be given tax credits if a, you know a, a tick box list of things are done. Have you done it this way? That, 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 that. You've done the script, you've done the budget, you've registered the company, you've got so much investment into it. Then you can sell it to shareholders, anyone comes along and they can get the tax relief in that year and the movie has to be finished and a, and a finished product has to be sent back to the tax office on DVD or whatever is it hey this is a finished product it's ready for sale now whether you'll get a sale or not that's a different matter but at least the government should help out in that way and I think what we're doing with the PLC is the forerunner it's the test case of we have thought about it in a certain way I mean Lance and I spent quite some time discussing how we put this together and what our approach was going to be and we have a good prospectus so transparency is the first thing, raising the funds so that we do a British movie the way it should be done and not having the usual interference from, from Hollywood or even some of the top producers in the UK here. It's the same old story, it's the same old excuses and it's all just about putting money in their pockets as producer and the movie never makes, makes, makes a profit at all. So by remaining independent, you've got control of... It is, it, is, it is most important that we control the project. Mm. You know, um, I've had some feedback from the States, well, if you get this actor in it, um, then we might put some money in. Well, what does that mean, we might put some money in? Or, uh, Robin, you really can't direct it, you have no track record, um, but we get this guy in, well, okay, get Steven Spielberg in, if you want. You've got another hundred million pounds to invest, because when he comes on board, that's the price it's going to be. And quite honestly, he's a great director, but not all of his movies make money. <laughs> you know, it takes a while to get their money back, so he's not a shoe in And you, you come down to one basic fact. There is no director, no producer in this planet who can guarantee a box office, box office success. More important, there is not a single actor on this planet that can guarantee a box office success. Yes, there are actors that have great movies. Johnny Depp is a great actor. He's done great, great movies with, with the Caribbean series. But a lot of his movies don't make that much money. He's just a great actor. I mean, Tom Cruise, I mean, he's done some great movies uh, and he's done some bummers and he cannot guarantee a box office success. So what makes a box office success is really the story. Does the story click at, at a particular time? I mean, let's look at Harry Potter. There is no actor in Harry Potter that can guarantee that movie is a success. It's the book and the stories. Twilight Zone, there's no big name in there. In fact, if you look at the top 10 movies last year of 2009, nine of them had basically what you would classify as no big star or no name or no star that is a seller. So let's get back to basics. It's about making a good movie. Lawrence of Arabia didn't have any big names. It had Anthony Quinn, who was a big American star, because the perception was we need that to sell it to America. Anthony Quayle, 
Peter O'Toole was a virtual unknown, Omar Sharif was a virtual unknown. It was the story. And you come back to, is the story, does the story catch with the public? Now, we might make a great movie, and the music will be great, and the locations will be great, and the acting will be great, and everything will be great, and it might not just catch with the audience. And like so many movies, in five or ten years' time, suddenly someone discovers them and goes, wow, isn't this great? And it gets a re-release, and it suddenly makes a bundle of money.